Okay. Hello and welcome. I'm Shian Costello. Uh, I'm the artistic director of Kimor Festival for Contemporary Piano. And I'm here uh, today speaking as a preview event for the festival on December 17th, Saturday, December 17th at Piano Forte Studios in Chicago. Uh, as a preview to that and many future events, I wanted to bring uh, to, the, to the discussion room, uh, my good friend from uh, grad school, uh, Rich Coburn, who has a lot of really amazing projects that uh, he continues to do uh, throughout his career. And in particular right now, uh, he is the uh, director and founder of BIPOC Voices. And he also works in uh, a number of different capacities as a pianist and uh, educator. Uh, he teaches music uh, business at McGill University and uh, just a lot of different activities that to me somehow connect to the piano. And we can have a, a, an interesting little um, debate about that, but obviously I'm myopically fo focused on the piano uh, for these particular conversations. Um, so Rich is a friend from, uh, from grad school, like I said, and we were classmates in the same studio. And honestly, Rich, you're like one of my favorite people to talk to. I think our conversations are always really interesting to me. Uh, you're, you have great like insight and like balanced, thoughtful ideas about music and non-musical things. So I'm really excited to dig in with you and be sort of like this little parrot that keeps bringing it back to piano, even though our conversations don't always revolve around piano. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Shian. It's great to be here. Great to chat with you as always. And, um, you know, it's fun for me because, uh, you know, I start piano is sort of the through line in my career in a lot of ways. It's what I started when it's what I come back to all the time, even though I'm often branching off in different directions. But I, as you say, I am doing so many other projects. For me, when I get back to come back to the piano, you know, when I get to sit down and practice or like just really think about things, it's always like a, a nice little refreshing thing. It's like, oh, yeah, this is nice. Oh, and, and that's my cat, Paulette, who you will hear because uh, she's very vocal. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. You have, uh, you know, we were solo piano uh, classmates, right? And we were working on, at least for the degree, <laughs> uh, solo repertoire. Uh, and something I've always seen you be have a huge part of your, of your identity as an artist is to work with vocalists. Um, a cat or a human um and and i think like that's something that i've always associated with you with um that kind of leads me to seeing the birth of bipoc voices which is vocally centered it's centered on vocal music uh that is unplayed or underplayed by people who identify as uh, black indigenous or person of color mm -hmm. so my question <laughs> i promised you it would still be a question um <laughs> is how do you navigate your um, like incredibly rich practice in the past and presently uh, with working with singers, working with vocalists as a pianist with piano training and playing the piano um, and thinking of music through the piano and, and kind of match that with this whole new world where you're making these high quality uh, MIDI realizations of works and providing this service to, to people who've written for uh for for voice in some form yeah i mean that's a <laughs> that's an interesting question because you know as you articulated in the introduction everything that i do sort of feels like it makes sense on a through line to me but when asked to articulate it's not always so easy <laughs> i think i think that the something that i learned about myself later on is that I don't I don't think that I actually went into piano because I love piano and I don't think that I went into piano because I love performing. I think that I went into piano because I loved um I loved being able to express myself. I loved the I mean being a pianist is kind of just problem solving all day every day you know, with technical challenges, musical challenges, understanding what the music's trying to do, understanding how you might get there, all these sorts of things. It's, it's really a pro like a continual problem solving thing. And I love problem solving. 
And I think that those are the two things which, you know, as a teenager were true for me and piano was the easiest outlet for me to get into those, you know, to, to fulfill those, those, those two desires. So it's interesting because now I do a lot, I spend a lot of time sitting at a computer, which I never did before the pandemic, um, you know, making, whether I'm, you know, editing, you know, in a digital audio workstation or, uh, I mean, you know, just organizing things or, um, you know, but then I also do spend time, as you say, like, you know, working with singers and, and, you know, even playing the piano sometimes. <laughs> and I think that the through line is really actually these, um, these, the ability to express, not even express myself, but express creativity. It's like when, when you have an idea, when you're in a state of flow, when you have inspiration and in something, you can allow something to flow through you. They're like all these different media where you can just be there and allow something to flow through you and get something out the other side, which I find incredibly satisfying. Yeah, I think the piano actually has that um, incredible potential, right? Because mm -hmm. the instrument is so complicated. There's so much going on. It's as complicated as, you know, a computer, you know, any kind of hardware <laughs> mm -hmm. and and you're using that medium to express creativity yeah i mean and it's like when you listen to really great pianists pianists who you who you really love i don't this is like outside of the world of classical entirely but only because of it's not of it sounds but actually not because of the processes do you know jacob collier mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so i what i love about jacob collier is he has this amazing ability he his most recent album is improvisations like him improvising standards singing and playing and for some of these improvisations there exist on the internet bootlegged copies of other times he played the song in a different concert mm -hmm. and you see like these ideas coming through but they're manifested differently and sometimes he does things totally different and you realize just from watching a couple of these how insane his ability is to just go with the flow and and manifest something that feels so natural it's so expressive it's so um and i only bring that up because it's i think even more obvious in improvisation than in written music though even though it ob obviously it also happens in written music but also because you know the processes that he's going through you know the complexity of his harmony and his rhythm and his structural thinking is exactly the same as what's going on in, in a lot of great classical music so i think that he's an example that i love but it's you know, of how the piano, such a sort of literally wooden instrument can be made to, could, to sing and speak so, so poetically, so beautifully. It's interesting you said that it's like, you, you often associate that sort of um, expression of creativity um, and just open flowing of creativity in, in non-classical um, forms, like in non-classical styles. Um, is there, Obviously, the like there's a part of it that's so much more is notated in classical music, but mm -hmm. um, like, is it? Can you elaborate on that? Like the difference between sort of hearing something outside of classical and having those components of that like free flowing creativity versus within that sort of classical world. Um, yeah, because you're in both. Yeah, you've, you've, totally. You've, I mean, I do live so. mostly in a classical world, though I I operate outside of it to some degree. But I think that okay. So this is one of the things that I love about new music and you know, new music means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But what I mean is when I say new music in this context is music that people probably haven't heard before. Mm. So I just did two weeks ago, this con this uh, concert in Vancouver and through BIPOC voices, and it was all music from the database. None of it had ever been recorded before. So part of the project was creating recordings for these pieces. Mm. And because none of it had ever been recorded and because none of the composers were present, you have to figure out what you want to do with the music. You know, some music, you know, as you know, some scores really take you by the hand and show you very clearly. And some just give you a sketch and they say, go do something fun with it, you know? <laughs> and uh, so in, you know, when it's really tough and especially for young musicians, um, I think pianists and singers, you know, if you're playing a, a Beethoven sonata, you know, there are literally dozens of amazing pianists who've recorded this, who've recorded, you know, beautiful. It's like, it's so hard to get in there and and, and flow without the distraction of all this, like, 
you know pressure like cultural pressure of like this is how this goes it's like it's almost impossible um I, I mean I think for most people anyway um and so when you get to do new works you're required to do this or else the performance is not going to be interesting you know you're required to think and say here's a composer I've never encountered before what does their musical style mean you know what is their harmonic how does their harmonic language work what how you know lit literally things like um dissonances is this distance part of the chord or is this dissonance like being resolved you know really basic level stuff and then start to understand how you want to make music from it so from there it's much easier to get to me into a state of flow where you're understanding the music on a fundamental level and then you're you're sort of letting you, your inspiration flow through you absolutely that's really great point i think about contemporary music and new music like you're saying in terms of the using the term to mean um, basically less less heard or unheard um, mm -hmm. music of any time period too. Um, I think that is something that's underestimated about um, playing uh, new music or contemporary music. Um, it's exhausting. It's exhausting to, <laughs> to reset the entire grammar and vocabulary and structure of music itself within every piece of music you play because it's a different composer. So it's a different voice. It's a different mm -hmm. musical voice. And I think um, that is something that I think is underappreciated to be honest um, about new music playing. Um, and it, and it, to do it really well is very hard. It takes so much effort and time and, and responsibility on you as the interpreter um to figure it out to problem solve like you love to do <laughs> <laughs> well yeah but it's also you know this is like an economic issue of course also because you know if you I don't know how much playing you've done with like orchestras where they call you and they're doing some pretty standard type rep but you know how what an orchestra rehearsal schedule tends to look like not any it's, not, not anymore yeah I don't do that stuff especially but, now but yeah. yeah but I mean but in the past you've done it I mm -hmm. sometimes you know and you know how tight that is it's like get it the conductor they know exactly how long they're going to need to rehearse this because everybody already understands what Tchaikovsky sounds like and you know they they understand if they're playing wrong notes they understand you know how to move together like when you get a chamber setting also then you have this other level of complexity because you have to get everybody you know or an orchestral uh, context you have to get everybody on the same page as to what's going on yeah you know yeah yeah, it, it that takes so long. <laughs> yeah, and then I think the part of it too is that it's not as it's not as cumulative, you know. So, like in other mm -hmm. words, you work hard on some kind of rep, let's say Scriabin, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember one of the, one of the oh, yeah. that going on was Scriabin sonata. So, like anything, but it could be anything. Scriabin will continue to exist, and you could still program Scriabin for the rest of your life, you know, same with Tchaikovsky or Brahms, or right? mm -hmm. it's harder to have that sort of cumulative continuity within um, new music because it, it's not really like in the rep yet, right? My question on that front in terms of like the staying power and what you're trying to build there at BIPOC Voices, um, you know, and it's, it is new music. So it's, it, I would consider that new music. Um, and it, what is the what is kind of like the end goal that you see there? Because, um, you know, given light that there's this kind of issue of like, you know, how do you make something be the Tchaikovsky? Like, how do you make something that's just right. discovered in 2022 become just as normal <laughs> in the classical repertoire and just as beloved, you know, mm -hmm. as Tchaikovsky? I mean, this is a great question and I probably don't have the answers, but I tell you what, you know, my, what my approach is, there are a few things that we're trying to do. So obviously having the demos is great because, you know, and most of the demos that are on BIPOC voices, by the way, are things that we haven't created. You know, a lot of composers have demos that they have of their works, but there's still a ton of work that has no recordings. And if you've ever tried to program something where there's like a whole concert where there's no recordings, you know, you've got to either close your eyes and hope for the best, or maybe you know the composer and you trust their style, which is great, or you spend a ton of time getting to know the music. You know, and all these people, almost everybody in classical music is overworked anyway. So like that's, it's just not going to happen as much as we would like. 
And so part of the strategy that we're taking is to try to get works in front of administrators. So the concert that I was just referring to in, in Vancouver, that was part of the Association for Opera in Canada's uh, National Summit. Um, and it was also partnered with Renaissance Opera a Company in Vancouver. But the idea is that there are going to be administrators from all over Canada there. Let's show them. I'm not, you know, I can't hire a full orchestra and do like full operas, but let's show them some actual instrumental vocal writing. And as it turned out, actually, most of it featured the piano, because as we we're saying, it's so versatile, but um, some some instrumental vocal writing that they can leave and say either, hey, I want to hear that piece again, or I want to know more about that composer. So all of the works, and I and I hate the word I'm going to use, so I apologize. All of the work was would try to be accessible in some way, by which I mean to say the bar was kind of like, my mom would come to any show that I did, but would my mom, like she would come the first time for me, but would she come a second time? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so this does exclude she a buy lot a of music. festival pass. Yeah, exactly. That's the real question. <laughs> you know, and, this, and this does, I admit that this excludes a lot of work, which is good work that some people want to do. But part of this issue for me is getting this on stages where people are going to want to sell a lot of tickets. So, you know, there is a lot of work on BIPOC voices that is not going to be main stage material and is not going to be box office hits, might still be good work. Um, you know, but so part of this about creating these, if you want to create a modern Tchaikovsky or, or, you know, whatever, I think this is about finding things that people can turn around and sell really easily. I hear a lot of administrators, uh, you know, I've started going to a bunch of conferences, um, to talk to people about BIPOC voices. And I hear a lot of administrators use the word risk when they, when they talk about programming stuff, which is unknown or making changes which I think is a fair idea, though it often ignores the risk of not programming bold new things, you know. Uh, and so the idea, the, really the idea around this is that BIPOC voice gets to take on the so-called risk and say, hey, look, here's a ton of great repertoire. Here are nine composers. I bet you've never heard any of their music before, like maybe one. And I bet that there's some stuff that you're willing to go back. And the hope is that by doing this repeatedly, that was the first time we've done this, but we're going to apply for funding to do it more in the future and at different conferences. And by getting this repertoire in front of the people who are making the decisions on a regular basis, it gets easier and easier for them to say, oh, I know that name. Oh, I trust that name. So that's part of my answer. I don't know if that's the best answer, but that's sort of part of what we're doing. I do think that there's um, kind of like the risk is low, even if someone hates Tchaikovsky. I'll put it that way. You could you could program Tchaikovsky and half the people could hate Tchaikovsky and sit through it in the audience. And then if they hate it, though, you can be like, but it's Tchaikovsky. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then they're like, yeah, okay, well, I understand. It's like a <laughs> passive. I so my I think my challenge is that people don't love <laughs> Tchaikovsky more than they love hearing new music. It's just that it's like a, a winner's win setup. Like yeah. Tchaikovsky's already first on the search engine for you know classic right. music if you search like Tchaikovsky's got great search engine optimization. <laughs> We've already mentioned Tchaikovsky's name like 800 times in this interview. Yeah. Because it's just there and yeah. it's like already at the top. Well, I don't know if it's at the top, top, but well, it's, it's close to random. the top. Yeah. It's close enough to the top that, you know, you, you can use it as um, a placeholder for all of classical music. You know what I mean? Right. You can't do that for any living composer, no matter how incredibly like famous they get during their lifetime. If you hang around musicians long enough, you inevitably hear somebody ask questions like, is classical music, classical music still relevant? Right, like this is gonna come up at some point. And then if you can't hang around that conversation, it's not gonna take very long before someone's gonna say yes, because you know, themes like love and betrayal and and you know, all these things are still human emotions in their universe. Like this is a conversation that everybody in classical music has heard at some point and, and many times. And, but I think if you take that conversation further, there are a sort of limited scope of themes that you get to cover in, let's say canonic or, or, or older traditional classical music. And one of the pieces that we did uh, two weeks ago 
was a piece called Exile Slash Home by a composer named Joshua uh, Cerdenia. I'm not actually certain that I pronounced his last name correctly, but I think it's C-E-R-D-E-N-I-A. Um, and I loved this piece because it talked about the idea of living in a place which is not where you were born and everything's kind of the same. It's got this beautiful poetry, but it's the same sun that's shining and you only ever see one side of the moon wherever you are in the world. It's the same side of the moon that everybody sees. So why does it feel so different if this place is so the same? And, you know, even you, Shian, is having lived in Montreal for several years, you know, it's not that far from Chicago, but like, you know, that it's different, you know, <laughs> and like, and, and this was something that I just had, I had never seen art music addressing this specific idea in a way that touched me so much. And I thought that was really beautiful. Um, That's yeah. a great case for, for programming the rep that you're uplifting. Yeah. So something I want to ask you, Rich, was um, about just like how you got into like doing anti-racist work. Yeah. I mean, my, um, my journey with, I mean, I guess it's a form of social activism is, is sort of weird and unexpected. So all of my grandparents were born and my mother were born in either South America or Europe. So like I'm a family of immigrants. Um, and somehow th this, I don't know if it was because I grew up in like a very university type city in a neighborhood full of like university professors and stuff like, but like racism, that sort of prejudice, like was a very, very, very small part of my life growing up. And it was something that I so in a way that would be comical to a lot of Americans, because I grew up in Canada, uh, that I thought was sort of like a historical problem. Like, I mean, I didn't I didn't put it in those terms as a kid, but like I just it just wasn't something that I was that I was dealing with as a kid. And then uh, I got this opportunity to go and work in Richmond, Virginia uh, in 2017, which so I was there in, I think, January 2017 and and. Uh, the the unite the right rally in charlottesville which is just up the road was a few months before that and maybe october or something i don't remember exactly um and i was doing a show that was for black history month with an all-black cast and they were all american and it was just like a crash course in american racism like it was because of Vir richmond's history is like the capital of the confederate states which i didn't even know about before i went there uh the the you know so there's tons of history already there there's like museums there's like all sorts of stuff there's you know just hanging out with all my black colleagues and talking about like blackness and you know their experiences and you know we were like going around to all sorts of places um so you know we spent a lot of time in a van together and um and then just like seeing this city both richmond and charlottesville try to struggle with these two conflicting ideas um you know one of the things that i don't know if very many people would agree with me when i say this but one of the perspectives that i had there is that in that conversation people were talking about different things like so i as a black canadian uh sort of characterized the situation in my head before i was like oh you have like normal people and racists you know, which is like, you know, because I was like, obviously, like a very reductionist. And, you know, and there is some degree of truth to that, but it is reductionist. Um, but you also have, you know, when I started to understand the war, the civil war, I understood that from a Southern perspective, you had people who felt that they ceded legally were invaded. And then the invading nation tried to get rid of the symbols of their like personal identity. So like I live in Quebec and, you know, imagine if if the government of Canada tried to get rid of all the sim signs of French in Quebec, there would be riots in the streets. You know, it would it would not go as smoothly as it's going in the southern states. <laughs> you know? And so I was like that, even though I don't agree with that perspective, I don't think it is, I think, a legitimate perspective. Like there's a there's a logic. If you start here, it makes sense. You end up there, mm -hmm. you know. And so what I got from that is like we just. We're not hearing each other when we 
when we speak about these things. And, you know, one of the things that I've done is, is studied conflict resolution and, and negotiation. And without, I won't go on a long tangent about physiologically how we actually shut down and go into different brain function mode and are not capable of understanding those, those things when we feel attacked. But one of the things that seems so important about art to me is that nobody, well, it's going to be very rare. Practically nobody is ever going to get up and rebut the stage. You know, if you're listening to a piece of art, you're just going to sit there and you might like it and you might not, but you're just going to sit there and absorb what's going on. And it's this opportunity that we have to speak to people, not to try to convince people we're right, but just to talk to people about something that maybe they haven't considered before in a way, you know, and, you know, I say this thing about Southern, you know, some Southerners perspective of being invaded. And, and I know that I don't think I've ever heard a person of color in the States say that, you know, share that opinion with me. But I also understand, like, because I grew up away from racism, I have a lot less uh, race related trauma to deal with. So it, physiologically, it's easier for me to maintain an open mind. Whereas when people are having trauma responses, like it's natural and normal and completely understandable for you not to have like your most open mind at that time, right? Um, and so I think that's what started creating the seeds for me of like, hey, there's like, there's this way that music can be speaking to people, can be a tool for empathy, for understanding, for openness that, it's really tough to get to, um, you know, and not impossible through any other tool, but it's really tough to get there. So th that was where the, the sort of genesis came from for me. That was a, a long way of saying that, but it's sort of how it happened. That's beautiful. I love it. Yeah, I didn't know that. It was really, really cool to hear you say how that happened because, um, yeah, you're right. I never thought of it that way, but the stage is not something you can... Um, argue with right but it's the opportunity i think to um to invite people into political thought without sort of bashing them over it's you know it's not a a, a it's not a debate it's not a, a a campaign but it's but it's still an opportunity to invite people into you know um you know broader thought you know political thought environmental thought you know whatever i wanted to touch on the work you're doing um with like you know how you study conflict resolution how you're um you study the art of negotiation um how you work in music business uh department teaching course in in uh at mcgill university mm -hmm. in montreal for uh, providing like the resources to negotiate things like contracts and um and any kind of, it doesn't have to be a formal contract. It seems like it's very all encompassing. Uh, so mm -hmm. I wanted to touch on that for a second with you and, and hear more about that side of your life and your work. Um, and I may try to find a way to, <laughs> to throw the piano back into the mix. <laughs> but let's uh start with <laughs> the basics of your work in that field. I mean, I've always been somebody who enjoyed doing like tons of things and I just really enjoy learning. So at some point, um, through a really weird chain of events with my girlfriend meeting somebody to kickbox in class in her gym, like literally this is how it happened. <laughs> um, who I decided, things happened. <laughs> right. I decided that I should study mediation. Um, so I took this course and it was very interesting and I thought that I might be able to get some work in the industry doing mediation, but I found out that people weren't really interested in it, even in spots they could obviously benefit from it. It's just like, it's, it's, it's not quite a mainstream idea yet. It's sort of increasing in, but you know, just by the way, for, to be clear what I mean about mediation, I mean, an alternative, like a, 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 mo a mode of problem solving, which is alternative to taking people to court. Um, so there has a lot of benefits because basically people tend to, tends to be way faster, tends to be way cheaper. People tend to be way more happier, happy with the outcome. Uh, you have much higher compliance than with, uh, you know, court orders, um, et cetera. 
And I couldn't find people who wanted to hire me to do this sort of work. So I had a great friend who suggested, why don't you just teach this to artists? Like they, a lot of their problems might not be big enough to justify the cost of paying a mediator. So they're going to have to do it themselves. You know, if someone owes you a thousand dollars and you're going to have to pay $450 for a mediator, like, you know, probably not going to do it. Um, so I started doing that. Um, I developed a course. I, I worked with a great coach to develop a course. Um, and I've been teaching that now. Um, and, you know, the pandemic's been a great gift because I've been able to teach it all over the place at places that, you know, were interested in having me before, but where they didn't have the budget, you know, to pay my flight in a hotel across the continent. Like, um, so it's been going really well. I mean, it's, I, I, it's tools that I've used just like a ton and, you know, I think there's so much more to a successful career in music than being a good musician. Like, obviously that's a prerequisite, but there, you know, I should say there's much more to being happy than being a good musician. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, I really enjoy sharing these tools with people and, and, and especially getting back success stories of people telling me things they were able to achieve that they, that they didn't think they could have done before. Yeah, that must be so satisfying, right? To mm -hmm. get those kinds of that kind of feedback. Um, something I really admire about you is that you are like you always find a way to be like the perfect person to do what you're what you decided to do. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, like you go, oh, Rich is doing this now, and he's yeah, he's the perfect person for that. You know, like, I don't, I don't think that about everything that everyone I know does. I'd be like, oh, okay, we'll see how, but like, I, for some reason, you're very like on your, I don't know how you do it, but you're on, you just, you find <laughs> what, you know yourself, maybe that's a big part of it, but can you speak on that? Like, why is it that, uh, how do you get there maybe? Cause you, you explained it in such a funny way like oh kickboxing class girlfriends kickbox but there's more to it than that I mean, come on now if i follow if i follow the advice of every <laughs> random kickboxing classmate i am gonna like mess up my life and career horribly so how did you how do you do that <laughs> that's really interesting that you say that because i don't i don't know if i'd really thought about that consciously before um but um I think I think for me it's really important to allow space to play and to mess around with no objectives. Um and you know just before we started uh the interview I was telling you that December is going to be like a, an easier month for me and I, I really have set maybe a third or half of December aside to just mess around with stuff. Like I'm learning to do some programming. I've just found this really cool uh, AI, which has just been released called chat GPT that I'm going to actually use to help me to learn programming faster. Um, and, you know, I just like playing with stuff. I've, I could not articulate to you why I need to know how to code. That's a perfectly acceptable <laughs> answer. Yeah. Though. I feel like at the piano, like as a pianist by training, a lot of your life has been spent working on working at a piano and um I, i'm just i'm curious how does that manifest in that context yeah i have done like this also with the piano though yeah i mean i didn't i didn't think about doing this but i there are some things that are just fun for me to do and often they're quite nerdy things but i just you know do them anyway so i remember in my undergrad playing the two piano version of Rachmaninoff symphonic dances with my twin brother and I didn't understand the harmony. Like I knew what the notes are. I didn't understand how the harmony worked. So, and, you know, I had, I think I couldn't take the advanced harmonic analysis class at, for, because it was like a conflict or something. So I just went down to the basement of the library and just sat there and like figured out what were all the chords were and like started looking for patterns. And until I had, you know, I didn't get to the bottom of everything at, at that time through, but I did start to discover some really interesting um, things. I remember one of the things that was a really revelation to me was seeing Rachmaninoff use an A flat minor chord as a dominant in C 
major or minor, I don't remember, but basically the C flat in the A flat minor chord function as a leading tone. And that's just how he was using it. He's like, hey, leading tone tonic, not a problem. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, I guess you could do that. You know, and and so, you know, you alluded earlier to Scrab and I was doing a lot of harmonic research on Scrab and too. And I and I ended up developing a whole system of of analysis for late romantic and and um, sort of extended tonal based um, harmonies. I mean, the whole reason I got into piano was because it felt fun. It felt exhilarating to practice. And I think that I just have been probably lucky in a lot of ways to be able to have spaces and before I was doing it deliberately to like sort of fall into um and, and I'll also be encouraged by you know my family and, and the people around me to sort of just do things that are you know I don't subscribe wholeheartedly to like the just follow your passion mantra because I think follow your passion but make sure you can pay rent like you know it's not it's not a hundred percent but I do think that a lot of people focus too, like, put too much emphasis on the making sure you can pay rent. And I mean, obviously, you have to be able to pay rent, but, uh, but that once you can, you know, you sort of spend as little time as possible working on that, and as much time as possible discovering whatever feels amazing to you, that what, you know, you're gonna sort of uncover things and that, 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 that speak to, you know, what you can do well that other people might like hate doing or might really struggle with or whatever it's I guess sort of how it's felt for me there's this quote you know you read lots of things and one of the quotes which has really impacted me comes from uh what's his name Scott Adams the creator of Dilbert I don't know if you remember that comic yeah yeah and I I'm paraphrasing here but basically what he says is it's almost impossible to be in the top one percent of anything you know, you basketball players, pianists, uh, you know, coders, whatever. It's like almost impossible. But if you're in the top 25% of two things, which is not that hard if you like them and if you're, you have some talent for them, then you are almost automatically in the top 1% of the intersection of those two things. Yeah. Right? So it's like, am I in the top, am I the top 1% of pianists? Like, absolutely not. You know, but, or say like freelance musicians, Am I in the top 1% of like mediators? I've never even worked as a mediator, you know, <laughs> but am I in the top 1% of mediators for freelancers? Like of people who are understanding that conflict resolution in a specific domain of freelancers? It's like, I don't know. I'm sure there are other people who are doing this, but I haven't met them, you know? So I think that's also part of the answer is that by having wide ranging interests and just like following the things that do, when you can find ways to put multiple things you know maybe if you can even put like three things together you know making the midi tracks that i'm doing now you have to be able to like you know you have to understand orchestral music and how an orchestra moves you have to understand vocal music and how singers work you have to un you have to be able to play the piano to input the notes you have to understand the tech and, you know so there's like a lot of audio engineering that you have that goes into that um you know you have to have like so that's like at least four different skill sets which right. is just one of the reasons that I don't look around and see a lot of people are doing this in this way, like in classical music. You know, people do do this in other contexts, absolutely. But um, yeah, I think, so I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that is, um, there's a, a lot of like business. That's like a way of thinking of things too, in a, in a practical way. And in terms of business, it's impossible not to grapple with that if you're a solo classical artist. Oh, yeah. It's so like, it's the elephant in the room, I think a lot of times, because, you know, sometimes there's, there'll be like a, a setting where you're, you're looking for life advice from that 1% person that might right. actually have made it. And they're like, they never really, um, you know, you don't want to really, you want to be that too. So there's like, you don't want to close that door for yourself, but you, you also in the underneath the surface, and they're like, oh yeah, it's like way it's way hard to like figure this out as a career. Then yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I think that advice is so realistic and useful. And and I and I remember thinking this, or not thinking it. I said it <laughs> to someone who was I, I was um, giving some advice to like a a, a younger artist, a, um, a, you know, in, in school still. And I was like, basically said essentially like, you know, you could play piano, but then what? and what like you have to play piano and 
something. They can't just be, I play the piano and that's it. I love the piano. I practice all day, every day. I work really hard on these things. It's got to be like, what else? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So on the surface, it seems really mean to say that, but it's it's a it's a open encouragement. I think that I meant it um, to encourage you know people to younger people, especially who are trying to figure it out still, like career wise. Um, and we're always evolving and figuring out ourselves too. But for people who are just initially trying to figure it out. If you play the piano, that's great. What else? <laughs> well, so. You know, when we met in 2010, people didn't really talk about having portfolio careers. It's like the people who had office jobs or the people who were working in the cafe were just like the people who weren't making it. Like, this is just the discourse, you know. Even, nobody really said it out loud, but I, that's at least how I felt, which is really unfortunate um, because it like, well, it's, it's unfortunate for a lot of reasons, but now it's so great. I think that so many more people are talking openly about the other things that they're doing. Um, you know, I was working with a tenor the other day who's also a circus artist, like a trapeze artist. And he was telling me about like a thing he did, like where he recorded a piece hanging from the trapeze. And he was telling me how like he discovered this, this new breathing sensation versus from being upside down that he never would have learned the right way up you know <laughs> and I thought this is so but I think this is true for for everybody for pianists for all young musicians like you're saying you play the piano but like what else it's like the people who I'm interested in hiring are often people who I see having some kind of success in another area off also like it's it's not a negative it's a plus because maybe I need somebody who's doing something a little bit different like maybe you know, I, I need, I'm looking for a singer, but I also actually need someone to do some social media stuff for me. You know, maybe I'm looking for, uh, you know, a pianist, but they're like, I'm doing this unusual project and this particular person can bring this crazy perspective that I'd never thought because they're also are like, I don't know, they, they traveled through Siberia and like did their own car repairs and like, you're doing a piece on like being in the wheel. I don't, you know, I have no idea, but like, what an amazing story is that? It's so much cooler than like an intellectualization of like, it's a story piece about loneliness. You, you know, it's like, yeah. no, you like this person lived this. Like they were their, they were their own mechanic for like two months. They're like, well, I'm making this up. But, you know, people do crazy, amazing things. And I think that it's not, it's not, I mean, some people might want to make it, make it, you know, as just a, a pianist full time. And some people do and some people don't. And that's totally okay. But um, it is very enriching, I think. To the art form and to a lot of people to me personally I feel so much more enriched uh doing piano and other things than just doing piano that's your brand that's your new brand in rich yeah <laughs> um so thank you rich I really appreciate your time today I really appreciated uh reconnecting to um just as friends but also now like for a you know a listening audience um I really appreciate your time and insights into all the projects you're doing. And hopefully um, there's some takeaways for, um, you know, for, for a listening audience. And just real quickly to restate um, the purpose of this, uh, these, these conversation series here at Experimental Sound Studio, the quarantine concerts. Um, uh, this is all preview event, uh, this is a series of preview events for the Keymore Festival for Contemporary Piano. And that is taking place December 17th, 2022 at 7 p.m. at Piano Forte Studios in Chicago. Uh, it is a live in-person event and you can find tickets at the Piano Forte website. And if you would like to continue to support um, or be informed of what we're doing here at Keymore, please visit uh, shioncostello.com slash KF. And it should be on the screen of this video as well. Thank you again to uh, Rich Coburn, founder and director of BIPOC Voices, and to Experimental Sound Studio for hosting this live stream event.